All right, guys, we can go ahead and make our way to our seats for the presentation. We've got Rick Davis coming up to talk. He's an awesome real estate attorney, runs a title company, Rick Davis. Uh, RD Title and Exchange, formerly Rick Davis Title. Uh, before we get into that, guys, I want to just shout out to our sponsors uh, for this event, for, for helping us uh, with the food, uh, with the, uh, the giveaway, and all that good stuff. Uh, we have uh, Rex Roadblock, KC Investor Funding. They do 100% fix and flip funding and rehabs, and uh, that's who we use to do our uh, funding for our flips. He gets stuff done, can close super fast, usually within uh, two weeks, just in-house. If he said he can do the, do the deal, then he can definitely do the deal. Um, so that's who we like to use for any kind of fix and flip funding. We have Age Cleaning Service. Uh, she is my house cleaner for my Airbnbs and my personal home. Uh, Mindy Templeton uses her. A lot of people use her, she's really great. Uh, also sponsoring Rick Davis, uh, Rick Davis RD Title Exchange, that's who we use for all of our title work. Super fast, great interface, um, super good for investors, probably the best wholesale, or uh, not wholesale, but title company for investors, wholesalers, creative deals like Sub2 Seller Finance. Um, he's pretty much seen it all and can do it all. And so if you guys need to get any closings done, check him out, Rick Davis, RD Title Exchange. Uh, go and send your files to him. Also, uh, with Airbnb, which is Airbnb management, it also does uh, construction and rehab for you as well. Uh, one of the biggest and best Airbnb management companies in the city. Um, has over 100 properties he manages in Kansas City as well as all across the nation. And if you guys want any kind of Airbnb management, check them out at Airbnb. Look up Airbnb for Kansas City. And then finally, we have Rent Ready, rental management software sponsoring for the first time. I've worked with them on a lot of videos and I actually use their rental property management software. It's great, especially if you're a smaller investor um, with maybe a few properties, even up to a bunch of properties. They just charge one flat fee a month. It's super cheap, I think it's only like $10, $20 a month. And uh, if you get the right now, they have a coupon, you're gonna get over 50% off your first annual plan. I think the annual is like 50 bucks. I mean, for the time you save, and uh, it, you know, you can collect rent automatically, screen your tenants, they do background, credit checks. They, tenants can basically pay in virtually any way possible, cash, wire, ACH, doesn't matter. Um, it'll process it through, and they'll handle all your accounting, all of your maintenance press, all that stuff. That's what we use for our portfolio rentals. And uh, you should too. So check them out, scan that code, and check out Rent Ready. And then also, guys, uh, we are giving away a $100 Home Depot gift card, like I said. Rent Ready actually sent that to me to give away to you guys. Um, so make sure to thank them for that by just going and checking out the service. If you have some rentals that you need to you know, manage, or if you have another software you know, maybe you're not happy with, I would be super happy with Rent Ready. So check them out. And then thank you for the, uh, the video here. We've got the. Uh, Alla Cigar and Brewery guys, just make sure to go grab a drink, um, you know, to help the, uh, the venue out, and they have really good beer, they brew it all right back here, uh, it's really tasty, and it's a great atmosphere, and they let us do this event here, so uh, thank you to them, and with that guys, uh, we've got Rick Davis, and his presentation is how to wholesale from the perspective of a real estate attorney, he's processing a ton of these files, the assignments, and things like that. So some of the things to do a holistic view, uh, his perspective on how to wholesale properly, and, and frankly, just you know buy off market deals properly. Uh, as he's seeing hundreds of files come across his desk, and you know probably more than all of you combined, just because he's the conduit for all these transactions. So guys, put your hands together for Rick Davis of RD Title Exchange. Let's go. Again, I know a lot of you know who I am, and my hope is, and if you know who I am, 
You've probably also heard me speak at least once before too. Gee, how many times have you heard me? You probably lose count at this point, right? So I want to try to make sure that in everything that I say, whether it be background on me or the stuff about wholesaling, that we talk about something new tonight, something we haven't talked about before. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on who I am and kind of where I got into where I am now. So I'm going to go way back, further than I usually do in most talks, and talk about actually the reason I'm shouting out the beer and making sure that you go get one or a cigar and have a good time is because this is actually how I started my professional career was restaurants and bars. I was managing restaurants and bars when I was in law school. I bought a bar down in Wichita. It was right by Boeing. It did really well there for a while. It's not there right now. Anyone who knows Boeing might know why. Um, but it was fun. It was a great time. And I think that in some ways that helps talk about who I am and when I talk about some of my background and maybe some practical business stuff, you can get kind of where I come from, which is that entrepreneurial business sense. You know, that we've kind of started different businesses, starting with that bar back in the day to the title company now and the gap along the way. So let's talk about that journey a little bit here. So you mentioned it. I am an attorney. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Kansas City, Missouri, I went to Washburn in Topeka for law school, KU for undergrad. I'm a huge KU guy. If you're not a KU guy, you can leave now. Uh, if you're a Missouri fan, you might as well just head right out of the airport. You know, we get how it is. No, I'm kidding. So um, when I started there, and I was working for a firm out of Wichita that had an office in South Florida, of all places. So we were in West Palm Beach, and they were working mostly with, at that time, Auckland. Um, is everybody familiar with Auckland? Surprised to see so many knows actually. They're one of the largest mortgage servicing companies in the country. So they handle residential mortgages. And how my career started with them, so again I mentioned there was that office out of West Palm Beach. It was basically staffed by one attorney partner who had the relationship with Auckland that was bringing in at that point, I think 30, 40% of the billables from that offer. She decided, hey, I'd like to take this out on my own and I need some people to come with me. And so she came to me and well, I think she came to everybody in the law firm and they all said no. Then she came to me and said, hey, would you come out to South Florida with us and help us get this started? And so um, I went out to South Florida for a couple years and worked with this law firm based out of West Palm Beach that, again, dealt mostly with Auckland. Now, one of the kind of fun things about my history or that I think is interesting is timing is so important in life, right? And the timing of this worked out great where then Auckland immediately purchased two companies equal to it in size. So they bought Homeward. Has anyone heard of Homeward? We'll talk about Homeward Services. Then they bought the ResCap group, which included a few different companies. And so they tripled in size almost immediately. Um, I spent a lot of time working actually in the Auckland law offices there. Uh, and helped them both with the transition with these new firms. And we also did a lot of what we were called managing counsel. So we would do a lot of supervising and overseeing the firms throughout the country. And so we're not going to talk a lot, although I might mention pre-foreclosures a little bit today. When we talk about pre-foreclosures, one of the reasons that I do so many of them have so much experience is because I've been a managing counsel for just about every foreclosure firm you're going to deal with out here. I know the managing partners, known them for 10 years or so, going back to that history. Um, from there, we went and expanded. We started adding other mortgage servicing companies to our portfolio as a law firm there, that firm down in South Florida. Um, one of the big ones at the time was Shell Point. Um, they're Shell Point New Res, a couple different names these days, New, Res, New Residential back in the day. Um, they're based out of Greenville, South Carolina. Again, similar to Aquan, I worked out of their law department as an outside in-house counsel, got to see a lot of how the legal side of banking and mortgage servicing work. And so I think that's kind of important to talk a little bit just to give you that background. And I think that's something I don't talk about a lot when I talk because I kind of skip forward to my law practice, my solo practice here. But to kind of give people that background, that's kind of how I cut my teeth in real estate. Now, again, something I don't talk about a lot, but some of this has become more public because she got in trouble, so I can talk about it. That partner that I just mentioned, I found out not too long after that, was doing some shady things, particularly with relating to billing, and I ended up leaving that firm. So she ended up getting suspended down the road. I'm not naming names, that's why I haven't named the firm saying here, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, but just a little history. And I decided it was time to come back to Kansas City. So, or back to the Kansas area, it's probably better stated. Again, I went to KU, went to Washburn, hadn't lived in Kansas City before. We moved back here. I started my law firm back. I think seven years ago now, something like that, eight years ago, I'd have to go look a little closer at the calendar. Out of a hotel room at I-435 and 430, I-435, it's a weekly hotel. Some of you may know it if you saw it over there on the corner. That's how my law firm started. And so when I talk about the wholesaling business, I know these things don't always directly relate 
you know, we've talked about starting a law firm, we're talking about owning a bar, we're talking about a wholesale business. I'm going to tell you, I have a lot of experience with starting businesses, with getting involved, with starting from the ground and starting when you don't have very much money. And so I didn't have an office when that firm started. When I said it started from that hotel, I mean with the folding chair and the card table thing that they gave you in a weekly hotel. My kids and family were still back in Florida. I was eating mac and cheese out of the box and realizing why I'll never divorce my wife. That's why we're still married. That life sucked, right? So that's a little bit about that journey right there. And so again, kind of started, got that going. My law firm ended up morphing over about the first year. It was clear that this room was who my clients were going to be, right? And so by that, what I mean is they were real estate investors, but not, when you say you work with real estate investors as a lawyer, a lot of people are going to think, okay, so you work with the big commercial developers, the guy that's developing whatever development they want to set there. I've done that in my career. I've done some of that, but that really wasn't my bread and butter. That wasn't the core. It was working with people that are wholesalers, the guys that are small landlords, people that own four or five properties, people that are just getting started. And that's what I really love. And so that's why I like doing these things. That's why I like coming and talking to these things. Because I've always enjoyed people kind of getting started, learning along the way, or continuing to grow and develop their business. So a couple years ago, I think it's been about two and a half now, time really flies, I transitioned away from the solo practice. I don't practice law in a traditional sense these days. A lot of the lifestyle choice, we'll talk about a little bit more in a second too. But, um, and I focused on opening a title company. And so that title company, Art and Title and Exchange, was intended to be a side project when it started. It's now 100% of my time. We work almost exclusively with investors. I think I say that about 95% of our deals have an investor on one side or the other. So it might be a flip that's getting sold to a retail buyer, but there's an investor that's selling it. We deal with a lot of wholesaling, a lot of wholesaling. We see wholesale deals every single day. We're closing multiple wholesale deals every day. We're closing some twos. We're closing solid finance. We're closing this, just about any creative deal you can think we've probably seen it come across. And so that's kind of where my experience with this comes today. And whenever I'm picking a topic and trying to come up with something that doesn't overlap everything I spoke about before too much, I try to take it from what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing happening and where I'm seeing maybe some knowledge gaps sometimes in the people that are doing the investing. Maybe you don't understand something and not you, maybe just in general. There are holes, and that's what I try to fix in. So beyond that, um, we have done just about everything in the investing world, too. Uh, we've done fix and flips, me and my wife. We have been a landlord. Uh, we have done a little bit of wholesaling, that kind of thing. All right. I'm almost done talking about me because I'm sure you're all tired of it, and you would rather me talk about anything else except for myself, right? But I was going to say the last thing here, too, that I think is important. This is a pretty personal fact, but a lot of you that know me already know it. Of course, Gene knows it. About three years ago, in fact, it will be, today is the eighth, right? Five days from today, three years ago, I had a heart transplant. And so I spent time living in the ICU at KU, just down the street that way. And I was there for a little over a month running my law practice from there. So again, I got a lot of experience running my law practice from here in small rooms. But I spent a little over a month living there, eventually got a heart transplant, was able to come out right as COVID did. It was a great time to have a transplant world had never been so much cleaner, and I wasn't missing any movies any more than you were missing the movies, or restaurants, or shows, or meetings like this. I could go to a meeting do. So anyway, the reason I say that is because as I dig into this topic here, I want to talk lastly about this, which is one of my kind of pet passions, one of my things that I see in the industry, is being careful when you're listening to someone talk to think about their bias, to think about where they're coming from, and to ask the question, what is that guy selling you? today, right? And I would say, we take it in the heart transplant world, I've seen a lot of things in medicine, I've gone through a lot of treatments, in fact I was there this week getting a new biopsy done through my neck and things like that, and I can tell you that sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this doctor doing this next test because they actually want to know the results, or because we all know my health insurance will pay for it? And you got to ask yourself, why is one of the qualification questions to get a heart transplant what I have for insurance and what my employment is to pay the co -pays? It is. It's a qualifying factor when you go to get a heart transplant or a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. Can you pay? And because it's a business at the end of the day. And so when you hear people come up, whether it be this group, every group, any group, and they get there and they talk and then they sell you their pitch at the end and they talk about their 997 class that you can get for only 497, because it's a great deal for all of you in the room. Think about that, okay? And so I'm not selling anything here today. I have a title company on engine. If you want to use me, that's great. I'd love to work with you. If you don't, I don't care. 
there's a reason I'm not talking about the title company and that I'm talking about wholesale and things that I think can provide value to the community because I'd rather do that than try to sell you on coming and doing a closing in my office because I want to help the people in the room. So always think about the bias and what you're hearing. All right, my last introductory thing, then I'll flip the slide and talk on topic, is this. Those of you that know me know I love talking. I love talking to groups, and I love it even more when you interrupt me. And so just because I have some points to talk about, I have some things, stop me literally any time. And so if you have questions along the way, shout it out, raise your hand, um, whatever it might be. Um, and the only thing that I ask is try to keep it at least somewhat related to wholesaling and definitely related to real estate investing. All right, and so I would love to talk to you about why KU is the best basketball program in the country, but we'll do that afterwards around the beer, not right now, while there's a Missouri fan standing in their seat, right? So, all right, let's talk about wholesaling. Who here would consider themselves a wholesaler? Let's go, let's go raise our hands. I liked it earlier when you all made noise. If you consider yourself a wholesaler, make a little noise. Wow. If you are excited about being a wholesaler, make a little noise. Maybe I need to pick a different topic. No one even wants to do this business, right? So, all right, if you consider yourself a real estate investor, make some noise. Yeah! Who wants to make money? Yeah! All right, who wants to at least talk about wholesale? Yeah! Let's take that. All right. So we don't have a lot of people here that say they would identify as wholesaling. So let's talk about what wholesaling is. So, you know, is there anyone in the room, and I won't make you raise your hands, I never like to call someone out on a lack of knowledge thing, but, um, you know, who doesn't, who's never heard the phrase wholesaling, who doesn't know what wholesaling is. And so, you know, what it is in the context of real estate at its very core is purchasing a property and reselling. And we're going to nuance that a little bit here in just a moment. But has everyone heard of the wholesaler in the retail industry, right? Or in the liquor industry, talking about the bar. There's going to be a wholesaler in the middle, right? Often that's gonna get it out. So it's a middleman. It's a person that's going to buy something from the distributor, from the manufacturer, whatever they are. They're gonna then put their markup in the middle and then they're gonna sell it to a retailer or then buy it, right? It's the same thing in real estate. Wholesaling is that same concept. So you're gonna buy this property from someone, whatever it might be, or you're going to obtain it. We'll talk about whether you buy it or not in a second. You're gonna obtain the ability to buy it. You're going to then mark it off. You're gonna sell it. You're gonna to try to make some profit in the middle. At least that's the goal, right? So now there are really kind of two types of wholesaling, and I'm going to talk about that distinction a little bit. And I'm talking now real estate wholesaling. There are really kind of two different ways to do it, and there are some differences in the legalities and the legal considerations between the two. So there's wholesaling like you would retail, what I just said there. So that means you're going to go down the street to 1234 Main Street, you're going to buy and close 1234 Main Street, you're going to resell it for a profit. That's one type of wholesaling. Does anybody in this room do that type of wholesaling? I know a few of you do, but I won't call you out. Yep. All right. The other type of wholesaling is what's called assignment contracts, you know, and it's dealing with assignment contracts. That's where things get a little murkier, and we're going to talk about that murkiness here in just a minute. And so with a wholesale assignment deal, instead of going in and closing and purchasing that property and actually selling it, you're going to go get it under contract, and then you're going to sell that contract to an end buyer usually an investor. Not always. I've seen it happen with retail buyers, particularly in certain markets, but um, that's, that's the concept. And so we're going to talk about that distinction a little bit more here as we go throughout the night. And so I'm going to come back to that. So let's go ahead and talk for a minute. Well, let's talk about this first. Let's put a disclaimer here. I mentioned I'm a real estate attorney. We talked about that. We also mentioned that I don't have an active practice at this point. And I'm going to mention right now that I'm not any of yours, real estate attorney, or at least in the context of this conversation that we're having right now, maybe we have another relationship. So this information is all kind of for informational purposes, and it's to help you learn something. I'm going to recommend that I might talk down the road about why you should be your own attorney to talk to about your business model. Uh, but let's start there. The other thing that I want to talk about as we start to break down different types of wholesaling and different types of assignment contracts and that kind of things is that I would make the premise, and we'll see who agrees in here, that just about any purchasing, selling, or investment in real estate is involving a calculated risk. If you purchase real estate, there are risks. Would anyone disagree? I'll try to force some interaction. Does anyone disagree that there are risks when you buy real estate? Right. 
there's always risks. Whether you're buying the property that you've been a tenant in for 10 years or buying your mother's house, whatever it might be, there might be something hidden behind the walls you don't know about. There might be some title claim down the road. There might be whatever it might be. And the same is true of any of this. If you're investing as a venture capitalist and you're investing in a startup in Silicon Valley, there's risks involved, right? If you're investing in the stock market, there's a lot of risks involved, depending on what you're investing in. And so as we talk about legality, I want people to think of it from that perspective. And again, I'm not gonna give you advice on what you should or shouldn't do here today. I'm gonna give you some things to think about, some legal areas, some legal grace, some legal concerns, and then you have to make the, decide for your, make the decision for yourself if that's a calculated risk that you're willing to take for your investment strategy. And so that's what we're gonna talk when we get into legality here in just a moment. So before we dig into that, let's go back to this idea of assigning contracts, because that's where I'm gonna sit for a while today. I think I'll probably spend three, four hours on this topic before I segue to the next. So that's why I just paid attention, trying to see who's paying attention and listening. So, so it won't be three to four hours, it'll only be two to three, I promise. So, all right. So with an assignment contract, I want to talk about what that really means and why these distinctions are important, which we'll talk about over the next 10 or 15 minutes in more detail here. So has anyone here ever purchased an assignment contract, ever purchased a property from a wholesaler? Most of them. Okay. When I go back to Dan, we get a little better response, I think. So do you really think about what you're buying, though? Let me ask, are you buying a property when you purchase an assignment contract when you sign an assignment contract from a wholesaler, are you purchasing real estate? It's a bit of a trick question. Whoever spoke speak louder, I can't see either that Purchasing well. paper. Purchasing the contract. Yep, you're purchasing the contract. And as we talk about some of the legalities or legal thoughts when it comes to investment, it's important to always remember that if you're purchasing an assignment contract, or you're signing an assignment contract, you're purchasing property from a wholesaler that's not going to close on the property, so you're purchasing the right to purchase. You are purchasing the contract. So what does that mean? Obviously, from a practical sense, you're gonna get the property at the end of the road, right? That's why you're doing it, that's what you wanna do. But you're not buying the property from someone that owns it. And so if you think about it in the context of anything, if I wanted to come buy this bar, I'd have to talk to the owner. I'm not gonna be able to come buy it from just some guy sitting in the corner of the bar, right? He has to have some right to buy it. And so they're selling you that right to buy it because they've already entered a contract. And I'm gonna break this down a little bit more here in kind of the next section of what I wanna talk about. But you gotta think about that because that means that you're buying whatever is bound in those terms and whatever agreements, whatever obligations, rights, responsibilities that the person, the wholesaler, entered into in that contract. And so I mentioned I'm gonna talk about this from a real life perspective. And some of the things that I see a lot and that I feel like has popped up recently a little bit more, is if you're purchasing a contract and the contract says it's gonna close on March 31st, and your assignment contract say you're gonna close on April 7th. Anyway, I saw a couple head shakes. I can really only see the first two rows though with these bright lights, but um, okay, so no, you can't. And that's an exact example that I've seen pop up in the past two weeks three or four times where people have been in that. So my end investor is like, well, my contract says we close on April 7th. I'm like, that's great. Get the seller to sign an extension, we're all good. So you can't force someone to do something that they don't want to do, right? So if the seller agreed to sell the property by the 31st, you can't say, hey, we've done this down the road. We're going to sell it on the 7th. So I'm going to get into that a little bit more. I brought that up now as kind of more of a kind of introductory uh, thought as opposed to breaking down the contracts too much. I'm like four slides ahead of myself here. So. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about the legality of wholesaling. Who in here has a real estate license? All right. Are any of you that raise your hand have a real estate license doing assignment contract wholesaling? Right. So that brings up some questions. Now we talked about at the beginning that real estate is a calculated risk, and I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do it. We're gonna talk about some of the risks that come in for real estate agent, I think in fact, if you want to follow the theme of what the Real Estate Agents Commission will want you to do, you should be licensed. But there are some kind of complications and some additional things to think up. Now, those of you that have wholesale that you've done an assignment contract and aren't licensed, raise your hand. There's a good number of that, probably 50-50-ish that we see in the course of our, our time here in the title company. And so I want to talk about whether or not, let's start with that concept of whether you have to have a license 
Anyone have any thoughts on that? Do you think that as we sit here today, you have to have a license to do a wholesale contract? No. no. Right. I heard no. No is correct. So, you know, and so I'm going to talk a little bit, and this is why I wanted to walk back over to my little screen here, because I have some things to read. So I talked a little bit, though, you know, the concept is no, but I'm going to read to you some actual quotes from the real estate licensing law. I think I pulled these from Kansas. Kansas and Missouri are, are very similar when it comes to these certain sections I'm quoting. But here's one of the things that the laws would say that you need to have a real estate license for. It provides lists of real estate as being available for sale or lease, other than lists provided for the sole purpose of promoting a sale or lease where an inquiries are directed to the owner of the real estate or to real estate brokers who are not unlicensed persons who publish the lease, the list. So there's a lot to that. I'm just gonna look at the first line and I'm gonna have us now think about that question about whether you should have a real estate license if you're wholesaling. Provides list of real estate as being available for sale or lease. So, now I'm not gonna ask any of you to raise your hands about what you've done, what you haven't done. We're gonna just talk about Facebook. We'll just talk about Facebook in a global sense, right? I'm gonna venture that every person in this room that does anything with real estate, you're in at least one real estate Facebook group. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you in like 55, like I think I am these days? I don't know, there's a new one every day and somehow they all have a thousand members. I never know how they keep coming up. And so, how many people see wholesalers listing properties for sale in those Facebook groups? All of us, right? Every single day. How many times do they list that they have a contract for sale or that they have a property for sale? Depends, right? That's why no one really responded. It depends on who the wholesaler is and also depends on their wholesaling model. Again, right now I'm focusing on the assignment contract. So, again, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of answers here. I don't think that even if I was your individual lawyer in a room, that answers are always the best thing. I think what I need to give you is things to think about. And that's a thing to think about. And so if you are putting properties out on Facebook and you are saying, I have one, two, three, four Main Street for sale, are you doing an activity that would be fall within the category of providing a list of real estate that's being available for sale? And a lot of people would argue yes. Is that a question or comment back then? Oh, like I said earlier, you were selling a contract, not a property. And so that's where we get into a little bit of distinction. And so this is where we talk about that Wholesaling, when we went to the question of is it legal a little bit ago, and I think most people kind of said yes, they thought it was. There's a lot of gray in wholesale. There's a lot of gray in wholesaling. And I think anyone that tries to tell you there isn't gray in wholesaling isn't being honest with you. Again, it may be a calculated risk. I'm not telling you you shouldn't do it, but I'm telling you we should all understand there's gray in this investment strategy, right? And so now, going to the point in the back back there, I don't know if I know you and I can't see you well enough to tell, but uh, is it Okay, so what exactly does your Facebook ad have to say to have the magic words? I can't give you a black and white answer to that question, right? But if it just says you have one, two, three, four Main Street for sale, you're, you're listing a property, right? Everyone agree? Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not you, have an assign you intend to assign it, whether or not that's what you're gonna do when they contact you is do an assignment contract. If you just list, I have one, two, three, four Main Street for sale, you're listing a property for sale. Now on the other hand, if you were to list, I have a contract for sale for the purchase of some property located in Wyandotte County. You're probably on the other end of the spectrum, right? And I like to say, when I was doing practicing law on a daily basis, I would talk a lot about spectrums. Because I think that that's really anything in the legal world is more about a spectrum. There's maybe your safest answer versus your riskiest answer. There is no just right answer or wrong answer. And so if you put that, that's probably on the end of the spectrum. It's pretty clean. You've listed, you didn't even identify a property yet that listing, right? You didn't say anything about property. You didn't put up any photos. You didn't do anything. You just said, hey, I have a contract. But the truth is, is that reality is going to be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, isn't it? So you're going to say, I have a contract for sale for 1234 Main Street. Here are 15 photos. Where do you fall? I'm not going to give you an answer on that. We're going to give you some things to think about so you can think about the legality of wholesale. So I'm going to ask you to continue on this idea of some different concepts when it comes to whether or not you have to be licensed to be a wholesaler or whether or not you're engaged in the practice of real estate, as some might say. So I'm going to read another subsection, again, from the laws related to real estate licensing. It says, assists or directs in the negotiation of any transaction calculated or intended to result in a sale, exchange, or lease of real estate. And so, again, and I think a lot of this comes down to, and I want to talk about it, you know, the different nuances of when you talk to your buyers, when you talk to your sellers as a wholesaler too. Some of that comes down to your conversation you're having with your seller too. And so if the conversation that you're having with your seller is, 
hey, I'm going to go get this sold for you. I'm not going to close, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. I'm entering this contract to purchase, but I don't really intend to purchase it. I'm really just listing it out there to my investors. Are you engaged in licensed activity? The real estate commission would think so. Again, I'm not giving you a like yes or no answer there. But again, these are some things for you to think about. Now, I'm going to note, I'm heading down a path to talking about why maybe you need to have a license in a minute. I'm going to talk about some of the complications of having a license because this knife cuts both ways. So the other point, the other section, and we're going to come back to this section here in a minute, but it says buy, sells, offers to buy or sell or otherwise deals and options on real estate. The reason I'm going to come back to that is that's the specific sentence that Kansas is trying to change. Um, but let's talk about that for a minute. So if you're, what is an option? Does anyone know what an option for real estate is? It's an option to buy, right? You're saying I have the right to buy this, but I'm not obligated to buy it. So I'm looking at 1234 Main Street. I could buy it for $100 before the end of the month, or I could walk away. Again, if you're dealing with options and that's what you're assigning out to someone, then you're dealing with real estate license activities according to the Real Estate Commission. Now, a lot of you are going to say to me, and I'm here, I guarantee some of your brains are churning right now and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not entering into an option. It's not an option saying I can walk away. I'm entering into a contract. What contingencies do you have in your contract? What contingencies do you have in your contract? Does your contract say that you can walk away for any reason at any time? Inspection. Inspection is a good one. That's a normal contingency. Financing could be a contingency. Partner or, approval. What was that? What approval? Partner approval. Partner approval. See, now you're getting a little bit more into what might be an option. And again, everything's a spectrum. I'm not telling you it is. I'm telling you these are some things to think about. So if you have no actual obligation to purchase the property, if the contract gives you the complete ability to walk away, are you really dealing in an option? Again, question for you to think about for yourself as you go home today. Right? So. Let's go ahead and talk about that point right there for a minute. We'll come back to those specific legal provisions here in a moment. Don't worry, we're not done with legal statute reading. But let's talk about that idea here of your ability to get out of the contract. So whether it's you that you're putting together a wholesale deal or you bought a wholesale deal, how many people have seen those wholesale deals that give them basically, like I'm saying, unlimited ability to walk out? Yeah. Now let's talk about out-of-state wholesalers because they're not here. And so they're easy to pick on. I don't like to pick on anybody in the room. How many people have seen out-of-state wholesalers that cold call people out of the blue, never seen the property, probably don't know what the neighborhood looks like, and they just throw an offer out there, like throwing spaghetti at the wall, knowing that they'll look at it later, and if they don't want to close, they'll walk away. People seen that? Have you dealt with that competition in your wholesaling business? Right, we all have, right? So that's going to be another thought that I want you to think about when it comes to wholesaling is what is the legality of that? So if you, and again, I'm going to just stick with those out-of-state investors. If that out-of-state investor is entering into a contract that they really don't intend to close, or they might, they might wholesale it, they might not, but they have no idea what the value of the property is, they have to put it there. You know, is there an issue there with their contract? Now let's take it to another sense. Let's say, let's keep these out-of-state wholesalers as the, as the subject. What if that out-of-state wholesaler is, you know, living at home, has no money, and has no financing or no options or no ability to get the money? So when they enter into a contract saying they're gonna purchase a property for 100,000, they know there's no way in hell they can purchase that if they didn't assign it to someone else. Anyone have any thoughts on that? It gives us a bad name. that 
go and they get this contract, they plan to assign it, and they don't really have any means or method of closing it. So I kind of talked a moment ago about real estate licensing law and a little bit locally all over the place here, but I'm gonna talk about some of the other laws that apply to wholesaling too. And so if you're licensed, you have to worry about the laws related to real estate licenses. If you're not licensed, you have to worry about them saying you need to have a license. But whether you're licensed or not licensed, you have to worry about consumer fraud statutes. And so in Kansas, that's gonna be the Kansas Consumer Protection Act. Act. In Missouri, it's the Merchandising Practices Act. And this is where you start to worry about liability under those statutes, is when you're dealing with the situation where you're a wholesaler that never had the ability to close on the property. If you entered into that contract and you put a bunch of contingencies on there and you know that you were never gonna close, you're only hoping to get it assigned, and in fact, you're actually shooting the moon on trying to get it assigned in the first place, because you probably paid more than you should have, or often more than you should have in that contract, you know, are you dealing with fraud? And again, I'm not gonna tell you yes or no, but I'm gonna give you some things to think about. There's a lot of people that would say yes to that question. Now, does that mean, though, that to be a wholesaler, you have to have $100,000 sitting in the bank? Anybody? No, it doesn't mean that. Wholesaling is a great way to enter the market. So it's a great way for new people to get involved in real estate with little or no money being put into it. What does it mean, though? You need to have a friend like the guy in the back of the room over there, Rex, that you could go to and you could get money if you needed to close that purchase, hey, right? Rex, yeah. And so, now that doesn't mean you need to have him drop that specific deal and that he said, I'm gonna loan you that deal, but you better have some relationship with some lenders, you better have some means that you know that you could come up and put up if you can't get the deal assigned. Other things to think about too is that you can always assign your contract for zero too. And you know, I one of these questions I often get is a title company, what kind of spreads do you see on wholesale? And I'm gonna tell you everything under the sun. Sometimes we've seen people lose money. You could lose a thousand bucks to sign it because maybe you're just trying to do right by that seller because you entered a contract and you want to make sure it gets close. On the other end we've seen people make six figures. You know, it's could be all over the place. A lot of that depends on property value and things too. So anyway, that's one of the things that I wanted to kind of mention when it comes to thinking about getting a wholesaling business started, or if you're in a wholesaling business now, is do I have the means, do I have a good faith means? Again, you don't have to have a commitment. You don't have to have you know, a binding offer that someone's gonna give you a loan. But do you at least have relationships if you have a belief, you know, a good faith belief that you might be able to get that? You know your credit's easy, you know you have the 10, 20% or whatever it might be. You know, whatever they're gonna make you put in, you have that access, whether it be yourself or a family member or friend. Do you have some means you can close it? So these are the things to think about because these are the areas where the Real Estate Commission and others are trying to clamp down on wholesaling. So I've gotten this question a lot, and I think it's funny because it's like whenever you get something once, all of a sudden you get it like 15 times because obviously people are talking groups like this and it comes out. So right around the first of the year, I started getting the question a lot about what do I need to do now to comply with the new law in Kansas related to wholesale? And I was like, there is no new law in Kansas related to wholesale. And then again, I got that question 14 more times from different investors. And I think where that came from is because there was a bill that was introduced last year. That bill was also introduced this year. I believe the bill has actually been introduced in the past as well that did seek to change some of the laws for wholesale. But that bill only passed one of the two houses. So just like the national government, we've got Congress and Senate, or the House and the Senate, House and the Senate, well, I'm a poli sign major, you wouldn't get it from me just describing the legislature here. But uh, the same thing with the state, you know, we have a House, we have a Senate. Last year it passed the Senate, did not actually get voted upon in the House. I think it had it been voted upon, it probably would have passed. This year it was raised in the House, it's stuck in committee, didn't make it out. We're actually past the deadline now, barring some kind of emergency action that it could be moved to the Senate. So it's gonna fail again this year. So the laws haven't changed last year or this year in Kansas, but that doesn't mean that people aren't trying to change them, right? And that doesn't mean they're not gonna change that next year. Because my opinion has been, and I've actually talked to a lot of the Kansas legislatures about this specific statute, or this specific bill, is that once it actually comes to a vote, it will pass. There's just not anyone pushing it hard enough to try to get it to a vote so that it can get passed. But once it actually does, there's not much opposition. I know when it passed the Senate last year, it was like two votes against it. So if that gives you an idea, it's probably going to pass. So be aware of that. So what does that law do? I mentioned that statute earlier talking about people who uh, sell, offer, buy, or buys, sells, offer, or offers to buy or sell, or otherwise deals and options on real estate. Well, the main thing that's going to apply to uh, wholesalers is they're going to add to that sentence. So instead of ending at the word real estate, it's going to say 
markets for sale, exchanges, or otherwise deals assignable contracts for the purchase or sale of or options on real estate improvements there. And so what they're trying to do is they're now trying to say that if you want to deal with wholesaling, if you want to deal with assignment contracts, if you want to be a wholesaler that deals with assignment contracts, you need to have a real estate license. Okay. I'm not quite done with the kind of legal background, but we're close, right? Then we're going to talk about contracts and some more practical things, and I think we'll kind of see where this goes from there. But Right? And that was before it was legal, the side of the state line. 
right? It is, wow, yeah, you get a half million dollars for that property. I'd love to see that. Yeah, okay. So what I'm going to tell you as a wholesaler, and I'll see, please jump in here if anybody wants to as an end buyer, someone that's buying from wholesalers. If you're buying, you know how to figure out what your ARV is going to be for your own numbers. And if you don't, you should. We can talk about that in a second comment. Absolutely. You know how to estimate your own repairs. And again, if you don't have a way to do that, you should. Talk to people in this room, talk to people in the other rooms like this. Figure those things out because if you're relying on a wholesaler's number, you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> Let's just start there. So I love it. I love it. They're like, there was fire damage on this side of the building and it needs new plumbing and it needs new electrical. Lipstick on a pig, $12,000. <laughs> right? We've all seen it. So, no, look, I'm joking and I'm telling you as a buyer, don't believe these things. But if you're a wholesaler, even if you're trying and you're in good faith, let's say you've been a contractor for the past 20 years. It's what you do before you got the wholesaling. Which, by the way, those are some of the best wholesalers and investors sometimes. Guys been in contract for 20 years. And let's say that you can really estimate costs. You have a pretty strong graph and it's going to be $45,000 if you have that three bedroom, two bath, case and all. But you know what? Why are you providing that info? Because if your end buyer ends up spending 60 because they don't have the context that you did as a contractor, because they chose different products, because they don't know what they're doing, because they hired someone to screw them, you're asking for the possibility of someone to come back and sue you and say, you told me this property was going to be $45,000 worth of rehab, and it didn't. And that is, you know, what's, what's the, as Winberries always say, ask me how I know. Um, that's one of those things, like I've seen these as a lawyer, I've seen these lawsuits where, you have end buyers going, you told me that I was going to be able to get $350,000 for that house. I can only get two hundred, dollars and they try to sue. You're not helping your ability, in my opinion, as a wholesaler, really to sell the property by providing those numbers. Let your investors do their own math. Let them figure out the deal for themselves. You're just opening yourself up. All right. We're going to talk about contract terms. We'll kind of see where we go from there. Um, I have keep checking the time, make sure I don't ramble on too long, because I will, so if I go too long, someone throws something at me, right? So, um, but let's talk about what contracts you need if you're gonna do a wholesale deal, and I think this is good even if you're an end buyer too, to think about it, because it also goes to that original topic we talked about, about moving the closing date, and that idea, is you gotta make sure that you have the right contracts. Now, that doesn't mean you need to have the world's best contracts. It doesn't mean that you need to get custom contracts drafted, although I might argue why you should here in just a moment. Um, you know, it doesn't even mean that you can't use the ones that you get out of Google's book, even though in a moment I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't do that. But what it really means is just make sure you have the right types of contracts is where I want to start. Let's start with the most base, simple idea. So what contracts are you going to need? You're going to need a real estate contract, first of all. So that's going to be your contract that you're going to enter into with the owner of the property, with the seller of the property, saying that they're agreeing to sell the property. What stuff must be in that contract? Now look, if you are a realtor, that could be a KCRIR form. If you're not a realtor, you shouldn't be using the KCRAR forms. Um, whether you do, again, we all live in the gray, lots of non-realtors do. But I will point out there are technically copyrighted forms that you have to pay for your membership to use. Bring but Davis's forms. Bring Davis. I'm not that fancy either, but I do have forms on my website. You can use those. Um, but the key is, for the, for the buy side, there's not a whole lot special you need to think about for your, I'm going to call it A to B, even though this is a whole, we're talking about an assignment deal more now than we are double close. But, um, you know, the main things that you want to think about, you do want with any contract, I'm just going to talk, this will apply to any of you, whether you're just buying it directly yourself or you're going to wholesale it. You want to think about all of your key terms, you want to think about what your purchase price, purchase price does not need to be a dollar amount, and so I promise that we talk a little bit about creative deals, this is one of the ways we're going to get into it a little bit. You know, your purchase price can be, I'll pay you a $1,000 over the pay. Your purchase price can be, you know, anything, and the way that we were taught in law school, if I go back in the day, is anything that's calculatable. And so if you have a formula of some sort in your contract, that's a valid purchase price. If there's some way that a third party can look at it and figure out what you agreed to pay, that's a purchase price. It doesn't need to be a number, a straight number. It can be the payoff. It can be a you know, thousand above the payoff. It can be whatever you might be. I'm gonna give you a little bit of tip too on that one, just a little practice point that I've seen. If you're doing that kind of deal where you're saying I'm gonna pay you $2,000 over your payoff, which is pretty common in the investment world, not necessarily that dollar amount, but again, something over your payoff, do write that. Don't try to estimate the amounts. Because what you're gonna find, and this is a good little practice pointer, is that the number that you get, if you just call the bank and ask the principal, if you look at the bank statement, that's not the payoff. I see a few people shaking their heads here, they know what I'm saying. 
And Rex can tell you too when you're paying off his loan. It's not the payoff when you look at the principal balance. That's just a part of it. And especially anyone here deal with pre foreclosures, anyone deal with foreclosure default properties? Yeah. Yep, I know a few of you do. Um, especially with pre foreclosure and foreclosure type deals, what you see is a balance is not going to be probably really anywhere close to the payoff because there's going to be attorney fees that need to get added on. There's going to be just a cost for a title search. There might be some property pros or property preservation, which is if the lender is built to go change the locks and mow the grass, those kind of things. And so if you're going to do that kind of contract, you want to make sure, you know, think of it both ways. And so if it's going to end up that it's 20 grand more, you might want to think about that instead of just saying payoff plus a thousand, maybe you want to say payoff plus a thousand up to a hundred thousand, right? Now I'm getting a little complicated here, but these are the things to think about. So that way you have an out if it turns out that payoff is 20 grand more than you thought it was. Um, another one that we come into a lot in the investment world in a title company is partial claims. Does anyone know the phrase partial claim? Sound familiar to anybody? One or two? Sucks. They do suck. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Especially because they're always a surprise, even to the seller who has the partial claim. So what a partial claim is, it's, it's a second loan or second deed of trust on the property that's related to a government entity. So when you have a government backed loan, like an FHA loan, right, or a VA loan, if you fall behind and then you enter into some kind of forbearance or modification program where the government has made those payments for you, so they've made those payments during the gap, a lot of times with that is going to come, you're going to have these partial claim loans that are placed on the property. Now, the reason the seller forgets about it, forgets about it, probably quote that, but maybe they do to a certain extent is because they are, they are zero interest, no payment loans. So you get your seven, thirteen, twelve thousand dollars, whatever it is, that catches the loan up and gets it current, and it's zero interest, so there's nothing adding on to it. If you got twelve thousand seven hundred eighty-seven dollars thirteen cents, the payoff is twelve thousand seven hundred eighty. Whatever I just said, I already forgot my own number. But I love them as a title company from that perspective. They're the easiest payoffs I'll ever get. They're going to be exactly what it says on the face, and there are no payments along the way. But the moment the property is sold, they're due. And it is something to think about both from a subject two, we aren't talking a ton about subject twos today, um, or an outright buy perspective either way. Because if it's an outright buy, either you or your seller, and most of your sellers probably don't have that extra 12 grand and they wouldn't have had a partial claim in the first place, right? So either you're gonna have to up your purchase price 12 grand or they're gonna have to come up with 12 grand to close to you. And I can tell you that in all this time of doing this and the thousands of deals that we've closed now involving a lot of investors, I have seen one seller bring cash to closing. So just keep that in mind, one, one seller. It's not the first, not only one time has a seller been supposed to bring cash to closing when we figured out the payoffs so, so based on the contract. That happens a few times every month, at least. But what always happens is the buyer has to up their price. So those are some of those things you don't have to, but if you're gonna close, you do, because the seller doesn't have to 10 grand to do it. So those are the things to watch too. On a subject two, you can theoretically purchase the project subject to that partial claim. It's really no different than taking it subject to the first mortgage. Both of them have due on sale clauses. And so it could be called due any time. Um, maybe I'll get into subject to a little bit more in a minute. You're taking that calculated risk. Uh, or you can pay it off at the time. Uh, but there are things to think about. But you're going to have to pay it regardless. If you go to sell your subject to three years from now to an end buyer because you're trying to get out, they're going to have to pay it. So it doesn't go away. It's a balance of things. So those are just all different things to think about with purchase price. Make sure you always have a closing date. That's one I've seen sometimes on contracts. We get contracts without a closing date. Number one, they're arguably not valid contracts. Really not even arguably. Kind of basic contract concept. If you don't have a date to close, it's what's called an illusory promise, or in other words, you a fake promise because you didn't actually promise you close by a given date. So that's problem number one. It's not a valid contract. Also, your title company is going to be like, what am I supposed to do with this? So if I don't have a closing date to put in the system, I have no idea what to do. So, Make sure you have a closing date of some sort. Again, it could be calculatable. So if, let's say you got to get probate done to get that cleared. You could say we'll close within 20 days after the completion of probate. You can do something like that, but there needs to be some form of date in the contract. Think about your inspections. Think about your contingencies. We talked about some of them over here. I think also came over here. Uh, you might have financing contingencies. You might have other contingencies along the way. You, you might be able to inspect the property if something comes up. Uh, all of those different things that you want to add in your contract. So, Again, and then the last thing when it comes to a wholesale deal on the real estate, the front side real estate contract you purchase, make sure that the contract allows for assignments if that's what you're going to try to do. Now, again, there's some of these things that you might get different opinions depending on who you talk to, especially if you're talking to real estate agents and brokers in particular, but 
you know, does the KCRAR form allow for assignments, anybody? Without a modification, without adding those magic words at the end? No. It doesn't expressly prohibit it. So I would argue it does, but I can tell you that a lot of people are gonna take the position that it doesn't. And so how you fix that is you put the and or assigns after your name as the buyer. So that's just indicated that it allows assignments. Um, that takes care of it, make sure your contract says it. There are contracts that say, you know, if you're pulling your form from some guru out in New York, it might say that it doesn't allow assignments, make sure you're prepared. All right, let's talk about the other side contracts here, which is the assignment contract. So the other contract you need, if you're gonna be a wholesaler dealing in assignments, we're not talking A to B, B to C double closes right now, we're talking assigning a contract, is you are going to need an assignment contract. And this is probably the more important to talk about because this is one that I see that gets messed up. If you send me over another real estate contract, so that KCRAR board form, or whatever it might be, and it says that Joe is selling to Sally and Joe is your wholesaler, you either have to double close it or you're gonna need a new contract. Because your contract just said that you're gonna sell the property. In order for you to sell the property, you have to have title to the property. And people following me here, does it make sense? Let's think of it this way. If you own a vehicle, if you got that Ford Mustang that's out front out there, whatever it might be, if you're gonna sell it to somebody and you're not a dealer, dealers can assign contracts based on the back of the title. But anyone else, you have to take title, you have to buy it, then you have to sell it, right? It's the same thing. So if you have just a regular real estate contract, you're not going to be able to do an assignment. Your contract needs to state that it's an assignment. Other thing, the reason it has to be an assignment contract is again, you're not selling the property. You are selling the rights to purchase the property. You are selling the contractual rights that came under the underlying contract. So that's what your assignment contract has to say. Now again, I don't think that people need to overly stress about contract terms. I can tell you that as a title company, I close some of the you know, whatever contracts you want to call them. Um, but as long as the points are there, as long as it's written on a napkin, it's signed, and the key stuff is there, when you're going to close by, if it's an assignment contract, you're saying I'm buying the rights to purchase the contract between John Smith seller and, you know, Dale Smith buyer, that's okay for this price. Other things, I'm going to talk to you again about best practices versus what gets away with. Best practices, you really should have an assignment fee listed on your contract. And we're gonna talk in just a second about disclosing facts to people. That might be kind of where I am because I feel like I've kind of used a lot of time here, but um, if you're assigning your contract, you aren't selling the property. And so you aren't selling the property for $160,000, right? What you're doing is you're selling that $100,000 property. You're selling the rights to purchase the property for $100,000 for $60,000. And really that's what your contract should say. Now I don't usually hold people up too much on that if it says my assignment fee will be the difference between or something like that. Uh, the end purchase price including my assignment fee will be 160. As a title company, because my job is not to be your lawyer, it's not to analyze your contracts from a lawyer perspective, it's just to close it. So if you get the point across, I'll probably close it. But from a legal perspective, from the attorney perspective, from doing things right that we're talking about now, your contract should say I've got an assignment fee for $60,000 or whatever it might be, for $6,000 whatever your deal is. All right, let's talk about this topic and then we'll kind of go from there. Hold on. Could you be able to buy the time? Is your title company provide templates? Yes. Do we provide templates is the question. We do have, they're very, very simple. I'm not gonna oversell what we have on the website. But yes, it's artytitle.com and then there's a tab that says investor resources. We have quite a few different resources in there. One of them is contract forms. There is an assignment form there is a contract form. We also have a lot of kind of curative documents that we kind of put in there to try to help people. So if you need a quick claim deed, they're in there. If you need a marital status affidavit, it's in there. I actually plan to build that up over the next year too. Uh, my goal is really to have a simple template for most anything you might do related to a title company. Yeah, best of interest there, talk about bias. But, um, you know, so, but that is there. I will, since you segued it, I will for a second, then we're gonna come back to this disclosing terms idea. But um, other things that I just, I don't know if people always know that I put up there that I think is useful for people to know. Um, we also have, for example, a list of in real estate investor groups and events that are going on, and so this one's on there. It's featured, it was a featured event because I was speaking, so of course, right? So I'm kidding, this group is actually always a featured event. It's great group. Um, if you're looking for an event, if it's a Tuesday night, if you're in St. Louis, and you wonder where you can meet up with real estate investors, we got groups that are listed all over Kansas and Missouri on the website. Go check that out. We also do have a directory too um, of different business providers. So we have lenders. Uh, I know Rex is on there. And, and I'm going to make an important point. He doesn't even probably know that because he didn't pay me for it. And everyone that's on our directory, we put on there unilaterally. 
either because I've worked with them, someone I've worked with has worked with them, or you know we have a reason. Now I'm not down for I'm, I'm not guaranteeing anything. I'm gonna be a lawyer. Um, you never know your service will differ with anyone that you deal with. But if they're on our website, it is not because they paid for a membership or they paid for a premium directory listing or anything like that. It's because I just I get questions a lot. Who can I go to for hard money lending? And instead of me typing out an email every time, I say, here's the list on my website. So anyway, to your point, yes, we have some contract forms. We also have other resources. Again, my goal is to get out as much free information as possible. That really is my life goal here. I know that probably sounds like bullshit. You can say it. We're at the bar, we're drinking beer, it's bullshit. But I really do want to help investors as much as I can. And I felt like I could help more in this way than I could with individual one-on-one -on -one attorney relationships. So, all right, let's talk about the last topic because I have a feeling that it's what got a few people interested in this, which is whether or not you have to disclose your terms to everyone and how you could not disclose your terms to everyone on a wholesale deal. And so the question I get all the time is what information is the seller going to see? I mean, this conversation can happen a whole bunch of different ways, right? And so it's, is my seller going to know about the sign Is my seller going to see the final purchase price? Is my seller going to see? You fill it in, right? Um, or it's on the other side, you get it. Is we're hosting the deal, and it's that deal I just said a minute ago where you're making $60,000, right? And you don't want your end buyer to see that $60,000 profit that you just made. So is my end buyer going to see my $60,000 profit? So, Anyone know the answers to those questions? Yes. Pretty much yes. That is the answer. Now there is some nuance to it. So, you know, I can tell you about the large <coughs> company, we do split settlement statements by rack by course, every single file. We do them on every single file. We're not doing anything different for your wholesale deals or assignment deals than we do on any other file. And I want to kind of make that point um, because that's why we do it that way. But on the flip side though, when I tell this to people, if the seller was to ask me to see the buyer side, I have to give it to them. If the seller wants to see the other side of the deal, if the buyer wants to see something else, we have to share it. Now look, it doesn't happen a lot. And I'm not going out of my way to point out if you're assigning a contract, that's not my job, it's not my business. But if they ask me, I have to tell them. And so those are the things to think about when you're dealing with an assignment deal. Now, I also say that, and I've said this to people before, because I've had some people, for example, we use a portal called Qualia, those of you that have closed it, we know it. Qualia, in my opinion, is one of the greatest inventions in the title world. Um, you all probably think it fucking sucks and you hate me for it. So I'll just be honest because sometimes it's a pain because you gotta log in to go through your documents instead of me just emailing it to you, right? And so, but we do that for a few reasons, one of which is security. That's really the big one. I've given full talks on that. I probably will again someday. Wire fraud, things like that. We also do it because it really streamlines. So a couple of people have said yes over here, thank you. Um, they're like, okay, it really does. You'll see if you're doing a bunch of deals. I think it makes your world a whole different thing. If you go in and see your 10 deals and the ones you did last month, you don't pull that up as policy or whatever, I think it really provides value. But I've had that question a lot. So in Qualia, when you log in, there's going to be a list of parties on the file. And if you assign your deal with someone, the seller will see buyer John Smith, whoever you're in, buyer is their name. They're going to see it. Now I'm going to ask a question that I want to kind of get some thoughts on. How many deals, well let's start with this. We closed well over a thousand wholesale deals last year, right? How many of those do you think didn't close because there was an end buyer listed in quality? It's a bit of a trick question. None. Zero. And so I sometimes think this idea of do we want to hide terms and things like that gets a little overblown and people get a little too concerned. If you're being upfront, honest with your seller in the first place, and they know that you're an investor and you're going to make money, they aren't going to get concerned. Also, a lot of times they just don't ask questions because, again, if you've done a fair deal with them and they know they're getting what they need, and sometimes what, and this is a whole other topic, and we've heard this in many groups, for those of you that are in the circuit, that talk about finding motivated sellers and what they're looking for. It's not always the most money. In fact, many times it's not the most money when you're dealing with motivated sellers. Whatever it is, it's they need you to be able to close fast because they're going to closure next week. They need your help to get stuff out of the property, whatever it might be. If you're doing a fail, fair deal with your seller, they're usually not going to ask a whole lot of questions about whether or not you're making a profit or what's happening down the road. Because they just know, hey, Gene's a great guy. Gene has made a fair deal. I'm happy with what I sold to Gene. I can only pick on people for positives, right? And so, but that is true, Gene. I've never had anyone complain dealing with Gene. And so, if you're doing the right thing, a lot of times that doesn't come up, right? I'm going to say the exact same thing on the flip side. So the buyer on the other side is 
always going to see your assignment because you weren't, they aren't purchasing the property for 160, they're purchasing the property for 100, and they're paying a the $60,000 assignment fee. They are always gonna see it. What I've seen though is that very rarely do they actually get upset even when you're making an obscene amount. Because if you've made a fair deal with your end buyer, they know they're still gonna be able to make money on the, pro on the property, right? They're gonna make a profit at the end of the day. And so, but I'm gonna talk about how you can let people not see this in just a second, I promise I'm getting there. But I'm preluding it with this conversation. Sometimes this isn't as big a concern as people think it is. If your end buyer knows he's going to be able to make a profit, he sold it to him on a fair day, he doesn't care if he made 15 grand in the middle. Because everybody's in this business to make money. If we're in this room, if you're selling to an investor, you're doing it to make money, right? So those are those things to think about. So with that, and I'll kind of wrap this idea of seeing things, that also goes to the thing because one of my favorite things that I see that makes me chuckle, and I'm sure some of you in this room have done it, and I'm not meaning it in any offensive way at all when I say it, is when you see an assignment contract that comes over and then the contract comes over and like they've whited out the price or some of the terms on the underlying contract. Well again, the buyer's gonna see that at the end of the day anyway. You weren't saying anything, you're just delaying the end of the world. And then that's gonna be the end of the world. <laughs> so I'm on this. Just delaying the end of the world to see what they're paying. The other thing is, is that you are buying a contract. And I had this very lengthy conversation with an investor the other day who was just pissed off that he had to pay the seller's closing costs. Now, those of you that invest can probably attest to what I'm about to say, which is 95% of deals involving investors and buyers pay the seller's closing costs. We all agree? Yeah. I don't know if this guy was his first deal or what. He had no idea that was going to happen. And, uh, and he, again, I think a 20, 30 minute conversation with the guy, and he's like, I didn't agree to pay it. It's not in my assignment contract. Nowhere in my assignment contract does it say that I'm going to be paying the seller's closing costs. Now, look, maybe it should have. I do see a lot of assignment contracts that do say that and spell it out. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because he agreed to buy the underlying contract. He wasn't buying the property. He was buying the contractual rights to purchase the property, which means he's buying all the rights, obligations, and responsibilities under that underlying contract. So the underlying contract said that the buyer was going to pay all the seller's closing costs. So that means he's going to pay all the buyer's closing costs. And so one of the things he said to me is he's like, well, I never saw the underlying contract. So this is my caution to all of you as end buyers and wholesalers. If you're buying an assignment, get the underlying contract. Because again, you are buying all rights, obligations, and responsibilities under that contract. If that contract says that you will only use the property as a public park, you're bound by it. If that contract says you're gonna build them a Walmart, you're bound by it. I mean, think about it in the sense of anything. Would you ever in your life agree to be bound by a contract that you've never seen? No, right? Who knows what you're going to be obligated to do? You have to wear pink tutus for the next six months. Like, you just don't know what's in that contract. I will caution everyone, and I know some wholesalers are hating right now for saying this, but you should always ask to see the underlying contract if it's wholesale paper. All right. This is where I'm going to end because I think that I've used enough of your time. It's not going to go to that magic question okay, I just talked about how everybody sees the deal, everybody's going to see the deals, everyone's going to see the contract, the wholesaler, the end buyer should be able to see the contract if they're assigning how do you prevent all of that from happening? Does anybody know the answer? I know a few of you in the room, you should do it. Does anyone know the answer to that question? Double, Double close. That's the answer to the question, right? So if you don't want your end buyer to see the terms of your underlying deal, then you wholesale like Walmart deals with wholesalers. They're not a wholesaler, but they're little people. You know, like a retail company is going to deal with wholesalers. You close on your property, you purchase it for $100,000, then you resell it for $700,000. It doesn't matter, no one's gonna know your gap because you closed on it. Now I'm sure there's at least one or two people in this room that are saying, but how do I do that? I don't have $100,000 to close. Well, the answer, there are a couple of answers. Now, number one, sometimes there are ways that you can use the end buyer's money on the first transaction. I'm gonna tell you though, a lot of title companies are just not going to do it even the ones that will, we will sometimes, it's going to be very cautious and very limited. And I'm only gonna do it if both of your contracts state. So your front end contract has to state that they know that you're going to do a double close using someone else's money, and your back end contract needs to state, we're agreeing to let you use our money for your acquisition. So that's it. The other answer is transactional funding. Is anyone here familiar? I know I talked to you guys over here earlier about transactional funding earlier, but what transactional funding is, have you ever heard the concept? So this is what I'm gonna tell you, a little bit of advice that I impart out about these things. When you're doing a fix and flip, right, you're the end investor, 
and you got to get a loan from a guy like your ex or any of these hard money lenders, whoever it might be out there, you know you're going to pay them some money, right? You're going to pay some interest, you're going to pay some costs at the upset, that you call that your cost of doing business. What I'm going to argue to you is that for a lot of wholesalers, you got to look at that transaction of funding as your cost of doing business. Now, there are great variances, and this is part of why I thought that it would be useful for me to talk about this topic, because I think that most people, when they hear transactional funding, think that's going to cost, like our money money, right? That's going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars. That's going to be hard to do, it's not going to work. And I'm going to tell you, I've seen transactional funding that does cost a lot of money. I've also seen transactional funding that costs what I would say is very little money. We've seen transactional funding deals with 250, 500 bucks. Because you're talking about, you know, and a lot of it depends on how much you're getting. So it's obviously going to be a different transactional funding deal if you're funding that $300,000 Joko house versus if you're funding that $15,000 house downtown, right? Obviously, they're going to be cheaper, but it can be a lot cheaper than you think. And so that's what I'm going to suggest to a lot of you. A lot, and pretty much all, of these legal concerns that we've talked about tonight, if you close your property, you resell your property, you eliminate almost all, if not all, of those concerns. So you're now not in a situation where you have to have a real estate license, because do you have to have a real estate license to buy property for yourself for your own entity? No. Nope. Do you have to have a real estate license to sell property for yourself for your own entity? No. So we don't have concerns about real estate license. If you close on the property, is it a net listing if you're a real estate agent? No. Nope. You've just bought a property and made a profit. Real estate commission has never had a problem with that. So, you know, again, it runs into these things. If you get into any of these other real estate rules, you can be under the fraud concerns. You have to worry about what your seller sees and what your seller doesn't see. You have to worry about what your buyer sees and doesn't see. Again, all of those things go away when you think about doing your transactions that way. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to start talking more and more about in groups like this, is just really thinking about doing your wholesale deals as double closes. Get yourself some good transactional funding. Again, we talked about it then, queuing it up a minute ago. We've got transactional funders listed on our website. We do have one newer transactional funder that again, I know they're only doing pretty small dollar stuff right now, under 50,000, I think, but it's like 250 bucks. Because a lot of times you're talking about tying money up for most one business day, sometimes a few hours. And so that's gonna be that. I will stop talking at that point unless anyone has any questions or wants to prompt anything, but I know I've gone for a while. So
it's a little bit of a personal preference, and sometimes it just comes down to the way people view it. Uh, but there isn't an option like there is in St. Louis over here, and some realtors are going to tell you no, they don't think they can do it. But as a lawyer, I feel very confident in saying you absolutely have the right to market it. Again, though, if you have the ability to close it, and you're under a legitimate contract in the first place. If you're just doing that as an excuse to try to put it on the MLS and essentially be a realtor without being a realtor, that's not going to be allowed. But if you have the ability to close, you have a contractual right, you're ready to close, you can start marketing before you
doing any deals, which he should be. Uh, Phil Tilson the Brick, honestly, he's the fastest, you know, most accurate guy to work with. Um, you know, his systems in Portland stuff are, are the best part of them. I've used probably half a dozen common companies in Kansas City, and, uh, you know, his experience has been the best for sure. Um, with that, guys, if you guys need funding, check out Rex, KC Investors Funding. Check out Remember Ready to Manage Your Rentals, Bear BNB to run your Airbnbs, and then Ace Cleaning Service to clean up your stuff. And then thank you guys to the venue here, uh, Alice Cigar and Brewery. You guys, make sure to get a drink and a cigar uh, and hang out for the next good while while we hang out and network. And, uh, and yeah, let's do it. And I'm uh, Daniel Zohan, just putting this on for you. And thank you guys for coming. Let's, there's some food left, I think. You guys want to knock that out? You know, we can't leave any for me because that'd be bad. <laughs> Wouldn't want leftover Chick fil A now, would we? So, I'm praying for that day, but. What, what are, sure. What's in your pockets? Let's see. What do you mean? Oh, the, the Chick fil A sandwiches I got stuffed in there? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so. All right. Well, uh, guys, thank you guys. Let's roll.